Good evening, uh, everybody, and welcome to this uh, very special edition of News 24's Editor's Table. Um, I'm joined by my esteemed Sport24 colleagues. My name is Lloyd Bernard. I'm the editor at Sport24. Tonight, we're going to be chatting about the return of uh, Springbok Rugby, um, highly anticipated for all of us uh, sports fans around the country. It's, it's, it's almost impossible to, to think that, you know, we last saw the green and gold on, on November 2, 2019, when when Rassi Erasmus' Springboks did, did such amazing things uh, in Japan by winning that Rugby World Cup. Um, a lot's happened all over the world since then, um, and, and, and none of it's been Springbok Rugby. Um, but we are back now. We, we, we turn our attention to the British and Irish Lions who arrive in South Africa for, for three test matches and five, five tour games. And, and we're looking very forward to it, and we're here to, to unpack all of that for you tonight. I'm joined by Sport24 Deputy Editor, Sibusiso Mjigelisu, uh, Sport24 Senior Writer, Kaniso Chwaku, and our Chief Writer, uh, Robert Howing, who's, who's seen more Lions tours than, than the rest of us, uh, I'm sure. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you very much for, for joining us today. Thank you, Lloyd. Good evening, Lloyd. Good evening, Lloyd, and to the viewers. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> I'm going to throw it straight to you, um, uh, Spoo. You know, you know, the question quite simply um, on, on everyone's minds is, is there enough time? Um, if you look back at 2019 Rugby World Cup, you would, uh, you would know that, you know, every detail, Rusty is now known famously for having planned every single detail over a period of 20 weeks uh, that led up to that November 2 final. Um, at the moment, you know, Springboks are scattered all over the world playing for different teams, um, there's different kind of levels of fitness and form. And quite simply, these guys haven't been able to, to spend time together in camp. Um, you know, that's the question. Do these guys have enough time to, to A, be competitive and B, come out of a Lions series with a victory? Yeah, look, we know that uh, Rassi Rasmus plans everything right to the T in Japan. I mean, he treated uh, the, the World Cup like it was Ocean's Eleven, didn't he? He measured the time it took to get on the train, on the bullet train, to training, where they trained, the humidity, the temperature, the, the surroundings, how they felt around the areas they were in. There's none of that now. I mean, everything, the, the, even the alignment camps just before they, they got together as the Springboks, as a first group, he had to do the first coming together online, him, Felix Jones, uh, and, and, and the new, um, you know, fitness consultant, uh, Andy Edwards. I reckon there is probably just enough time, but the scales are definitely tilted towards the visitors. This is probably the most even contest you will ever find between the box and the Lions. And what makes it even worse is that the Lions are actually going to get in some warm-up headouts uh, whereas the Springboks will actually just be training and training. They'll face Georgia twice, but not the level of competition that, for me, makes me uh, think that they're outright favorites. I think it's very even. In fact, you might go into that first test uh, with the Lions tipping the scales. Thanks. So just a thank you to, to all of our subscribers who've, who've joined us tonight. Please feel free to fire off some questions in the, in the chat panel as well. We'll be getting through as many of those as we can over the next hour. Um, and thank you to everybody who, who sent in their questions beforehand. We have a few that we'll be getting through as well. Rob, individually, um, there's no argument that, that the Springboks are a, are a power unit. Um, you know, 1 to 15 matched up against any side in the world, you would, you would expect them to, 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 to compete and then some. Um, but collectively, that's the concern, isn't it? I mean, you know, these guys, as we said, are scattered all over the world. Individually, you've got guys in superb form in Europe, guys back home in South Africa that are now starting to hit their straps. But the fact is, it's been 18, 19 months since these guys have played together. Um, how concerning is that? And, 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 and I'm sorry to ask you to answer this, but did the box miss a trick uh, by not going to rugby championship, um, you know, last year? Look, Lloyd, I think going to the Rugby Championship last year would have been incredibly useful, uh, not least for the fact that we would have uh, had the chance to blood Jacques Ninaba as head coach uh, and for the team to almost sort of, you know, uh, set the bed down under his tenure. Um, that would have been incredibly useful. Um, but, you know, there, there were very good, uh, compelling reasons for the box not, not going. Um, and, and I think there was widespread sympathy for the decision, um, you know, uh, in, in, in best interests. Um, to, to stay away. Um, I suppose the, the glass half full approach, which I always try 
try hard to take would be that, you know, um, the, the converse perhaps to thinking, you know, yes, the box will be undercooked. And of course, there is that, that risk. There's a huge risk. Um, but uh, you could say that they'll really, really be chomping at the bit, um, you know, to, to just get out of those blocks again. I mean, 20 months is a long time. Uh, that's like the sort of, uh, you know, the, the greyhounds waiting to get out of the stalls. Um, not all of them greyhounds, of course, some of them sort of meaner mongrels than that. But um, you just, uh, perhaps it were, you know, it may not all be negative. It may even work in the Springbok favor, that a lot of our guys will be quite um, uh, mentally fresh, well-conditioned actually, uh, because they've been uh, very um, diligently, carefully used during domestic rugby in the last few months. Uh, clearly with the sort of Rossi Erasmus and Jacques Nina, the magic one ever present, um, you know, behind that, uh, that drive. Um, so, you know, um, again, uh, I, I'm trying to look at things from a, from a positive point of view, despite all the risks involved, uh, which I do acknowledge. Um, but it's, it's, not, it's not all gloom. Um, and I, I, I feel that the Springboks will hit the ground suitably running, despite the fact that Georgia, not the greatest uh, lead up opponents, but they're not too bad either. Um, you know, there's been a bit of a clamor for them to be part of the Six Nations. Um, and at times, uh, you know, replacing Italy, perhaps, um, they have a, a pretty mean forward pack. Um, so at least in one key area, um, they will hit the string box quite hard. And I think the box will quickly brush off some cobwebs. So I'm, I'm still pretty optimistic, despite this very strange scenario that we find ourselves in. Just quickly on you as well, Robbie, will, you, will you expect uh, those two Georgia tests to, to be uh, strongest 15 type uh, matches where, where Rassi and Jacques get to look at these guys and their combinations that will be starting against the Lions as well? Yeah, I've thought about that a bit. Uh, you would think, uh, given the 20-month the lag, that they would be dying to field their best side over the course of both games. Um, uh, a, a counter view might be, um, well, you know, you, rugby is a squad game these days, and you want to get as much game time as possible for certain players. They will have looked at their list of players and who they feel might need more of a gallop than others. So it is possible that after the first test against Georgia, um, they might be inclined, especially if they've managed to, to beat them pretty convincingly in the first test. Uh, I think there might just be an inclination to perhaps um, rotate I would think not more than two or three players, um, but but maybe even more. Um, it's it's difficult to know. You know that uh, they'll they'll be busy fine tuning that aspect, and I think we'll only have a lot of questions answered about the Springboks as a whole after we watch them over 80 minutes in that first test um, against Georgia to know exactly what our state of readiness is, uh, and then they'll they'll act accordingly in selection for the next the next test for the second test. Mm -hmm. Can you, so I want to throw it to you and talk about the little bit of preparation um, and, you know, if you can view it as alignment that there has been um, in South Africa, you know, we, we know that, you know, bot management will spend time with franchises and, and share plans and things of the sort. You've got your guys uh, who've been playing at a very high level in Europe that have been in fantastic form uh, over the course of the season, your Cheslin Colby's, your, your Fafta Clash, your Damien Dialendi's. Um, the guys who've been at home, for, for this period of 18 months, who've now gone through these, these franchise competitions and, and provincial competitions from Super Rugby Unlocked to, to Carry Cup to Preparation Series to now Rainbow Cup SA. Um, what do you make specifically of the, with the Rainbow Cup? Do you think quality-wise that is sufficient uh, preparation to, to get these guys hitting their straps before a Lions Series? What have you made of the quality of South African domestic rugby at the moment and is it sufficient when when casting an eye towards the Lions tour? Uh, thank you Lloyd. It's felt a lot like um, a never-ending set of internal trials if I can put it that way where there's trial after trial after trial after trial um, with no selection in game in sight. Um, when one was watching Super Rugby Unlocked and 2016 Carry Cup there was a fair bit of turgidness to those particular tournaments it was like um, the players were just ticking the box to saying as Tosa, uh, it's like, let's just get this over and done with. Uh, let's just ensure that we've got some rugby behind our backs. So there wasn't an end game. It's like when we watched the finishing of Super Rugby NZ, uh, Super Rugby Aotearoa, um, Super Rugby, uh, this thing, Australia last year, you could see there was an end game, that being the rugby championship, um, where we saw that initially Australia looked like a very good side. But when you now throw it forward to 2021, you realize that New Zealand are streets ahead of Australia at the moment. And we actually sit down and realize that, hey, Super Rugby actually, actually misses South Africa. 
more than South Africa miss Super Rugby because I think as viewers, we would love to be part of Super Rugby. We actually miss um, the, the New Zealand component in particular because when you look at the New Zealand games in particular, it would have been very telling to watch how all the franchises and include the Cheetahs in particular play against Crusaders because they are the one team in New Zealand that ask Northern Hemisphere questions. The other sides play a bit of a looser game. The, the, I mean, the, the Blues are getting there with their forward pack. But the Crusaders in particular would have given all the franchises a particular idea of where the forward strength is. Yes, they've also got the complementary backs um, to make their magic work. But they are, and I think the Blues to an extent, those two sides would have given um, the, the, the local teams a, fair, a fairly decent idea of where they are and how far they need to go. So, um, I mean, the, the Rainbow Cup has been reasonably watchable. I think it's been a much better spectacle than um, Super Rugby Unlocked. I'll own up. It was pretty difficult to watch Super Rugby Unlocked. Guys hadn't been playing rugby since March. They then had to warm up to a tournament that kind of didn't have an end game. If, let's say, if the factors for COVID allowed that um, for Super Rugby Unlocked to start in July, that would have allowed... Um, I think there would have been allowance for the box to travel to the rugby championship and that would have given players an end game saying that actually I've got a selection point to prove I've got something to play because remember there were a number of players who were injured who were then able to recover through that COVID-19 period so by the time if, 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 if the situation allowed for a late July early August start chances are there would have been some sort of readiness for the particular rugby championship. And then the Curry Cup would have been that normal domestic, normal um, watered down uh, domestic tournament that you all know. Mm. I, I suppose the, you know, the, the obvious um, good things that have come out of, out of Rainbow Cup outside of the preparation is just the, the minutes it's given guys like, uh, you know, Peter Steph de Toy, um, Sia Kulisi, the, the Springbok captain, to, to really get those minutes under the belt. And both of those players that I just mentioned now looking um, in pretty pretty good shape, you know, with minutes under their belt and and Sia, we were talking about it a bit before before we came on air. Uh, probably in better, um, you know, match readiness state now than he was heading into into Rugby World Cup 2019, which which has to be a, a positive. Sprue, I want to throw it back to you. There's a very uh, interesting dynamic about this 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 Bach setup at the moment that has nothing to do with the players. Obviously, we've got a situation where. Uh, Poor old Jacques Nienaber has been the head coach of this team for 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 going on a, for 18 months now, a year and a half, and and you know must be the longest undefeated streak in the history of uh, of, of of Test match coaching. Um, but you know Rassi still very clearly hands on with this group of players. You see it in the in the media obligations and the press conferences. Um, it's very much a case of Jacques and Rassi kind of steering the the ship at the moment. That's how it feels now. You, you know. The one way of looking at it would be that Jacques needs to to stamp his own, uh, to put his own stamp on this team, and he should be given the keys solely. But given the uniqueness of the situation uh, at the moment, um, and that you're entering a, a Lions series with, um, you know, a group that hasn't played in so long, um, you, you feel that the more hands on Rassi is the better as well. Um, they've known each other so long that it's a it's a relationship that's clearly harmonious and that works. Um, but just your take on what's been a very uh, interesting uh, coaching setup and dynamic at the moment. Yeah, look, uh, I actually feel like we are talking about a, a Netherlands football team where you have a director of football and a trainer, uh, you know, just below which should be your head coach. We're just not used to it in rugby. I can't exactly say that there have been examples that have worked in the past. I remember the Sharks sort of tried it. They had Jake White as the, um, as the director of rugby and he was going to be appointed a Curry Cup coach and just things didn't really vibe quite well there and, and it really didn't end up, you know, with everybody wanting to move forward with that kind of setup uh, for that and other reasons. So I'm not sure quite what to expect from the Springboks. I mean, for it to happen at such a high level, um, you know, with so much pressure on the Springboks. Also, who does the pressure transfer to? Does it go to Rassi? Does it go to Jacques Nina? But it's, it, it really is a puzzler. Um, and it will be one to watch on its own merits just to see what the dynamic is like. Who is sitting in the booth? Because we're used to Rassi being flanked by Lindsay Vaya, 
as well as Bzwani Lestik, who are the bona fide assistant coaches. And they're looking at various different things while they're And Jat Nina is, is the guy on the floor, pretty much, who's on the ground and giving instructions and making sure that guys are following the plan, communicating between Rassi and the players. So now it's different. Jacques going to have to be in the booth. And, and where's Rassi going to sit? He can't sit in the suites with Mark <laughs> Alizan, can he? <laughs> so, I mean, in the past, you'd have your head coach, Springbok head coach. All your questions are directed at the head coach. And if there are problems, it's... What's the problem, Mr. Head Coach? And but now it's, it, it, just, it just seems a little odd. But at the same time, I understand why it had to be Jacques Ninaba who succeeded Rassi Erasmus if they are going to go this way. I mean, if they were going to have Rassi Erasmus as the director of rugby, there's no way they could have appointed uh, a Jake White, for instance, or another you know alpha head coach to 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 serve under Rassi. It just wasn't going to work because you have too many chefs in the kitchen spoiling the broth and the relationship they have. So they, they've obviously have the, the relationship to make it work. It's just the rest of us who are outside their little bubble that are just going to have to figure out how everything is going to work. And, and you know what, to be fair, they're also a little under pressure to make it work. And just because they get along and just because they've worked together for so many years, starting from the free state and so on, doesn't mean it's going to just automatic, things are going to automatically happen, you know? Um, I know there won't be mixed messaging, but if things go slightly awry, I, I just wonder, I just wonder if, if one person's not going to be thrown under the bus or if, if Russell decides he's going to take the heat, he, he better do so from, from the start. If he's going to announce the team, then he better front up to, to, to the questions that are inevitably going to come if, if things go, go badly. Um, but it's a weird dynamic. I want to watch it. I want to see how it develops, you know. Um, I, I want to see how Jacques Ninaba is as a head coach as well. I want him to come out of his shell, you know. Uh, he's obviously got that cloud of started off as a trainer, then defense coach. Then he's built himself to be an all-round rugby brain. I want to see that come across in the series. I suspect that, you know, it's also a case of um, desperate times for, for the kind of level of, of Rassi's involvement right now. Um, you know, I think when, when, the, when the appointment was made for, the, for, for, for Jacques Nino to be head coach, I think in Rassi's mind, it would have, you know, by now, that handover will have been complete where, where Jacques was the kind of face of the, of the national team uh, and, and kind of uh, running the show by himself with Rassi very much in the background. But I, I just wonder if the extreme circumstances of the situation have dictated. Yeah, um, yeah. Two of them are kind of now going, shit, all hands on deck here. We're going we're gonna to sort this out together. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, absolutely. They could just say, let's, let's run it back, guys. Let's do what we did in Japan. We don't have time to try out the plan, uh, the succession plan. You know, we have a template that's, that worked. All we need to do is just put that right back. And, and it's the same group of people, um, bar, bar Aled Walters, you know, um, it's the same group of guys. Let's put them together and let's, let's bring Rassi back as, as a person giving the instructions, giving the talks. And, and we'll keep Jacques Nina Bade in his role and doing his duties. But the template that worked in Japan, let's do that for the sake of time and for the sake of hitting the ground running. That might be the plan. Let's put Siakolisi in as the captain. Let's not uh, faff around with 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 anything that worked, you know, to, to save us time. That might be that might be the plan. Just a reminder to, to all of our uh, News 24 subscribers who are in the chat, please continue to fire off your questions into the Q&A uh, box over there. We're going to go through one or two of them now. This is from Piwen Denisa who uh, has put it to, well, one of, one of Piwe's questions was actually around the role. Um, has, has Rassi's role really changed? Or is he still the head coach in disguise? Uh, if his role has changed, do we not have two centers of power? I think we've just unpacked that very question um, in, some, in some detail. What are the panelists' preferred starting 15s, uh, asks Piwe. I'll throw it to, to you on this, Rob, um, because we were chatting earlier today about the fact that there's a very strong possibility that um, you know, the first test on July 24 is a copy and paste of that Springbok team that contested the Rugby World Cup final 18 months ago, with the obvious exception of um, Tendam Tawawira, now retired. Um, but I mean, is, is that possible? Just your take on, on, on what a starting 15 could look like for test one? 
Yeah, it's uh, it's it's highly possible. Um, I think given the unique circumstances, the fact that uh, you know they won't have played for for twenty months, and you know, okay, yes, there will have been the two Georgia tests as we as we've discussed, but for that, uh, you know, wish to hit the ground running uh, in the first test against the Lions, um, I suspect that it will be almost exactly, uh, and if possible, of course, if possible, considering that there might be some injuries uh, in the next few weeks in the in the lead up, we've still got a bit of domestic rugby to worry about, and those two tests against Georgia. Um, you know, who knows what might happen on the on the injury front. But in an ideal world, um, I suspect that the starting 15 may not budge uh, an inch, apart from, as you said, the necessity to replace Beast. And then, of course, there's, there's such an obvious replacement candidate in Stephen Kitsoff anyway, um, who is, um, I, I think, still, you know, significantly um, the best uh, current, active and most experienced um, Springbok loosehead prop. Uh, been captaining the Stormers. If anything, I'm a little bit worried about his volume of play. I think they need to start thinking of just scaling him back a tad, put him in a little bit of cotton wool, um, because he will be quite an important aspect of the, the, the series. Um, at the moment, the only other real concern, I suppose, would be around who would be Ibn Etzebeth's partner in the second row. Uh, Etzebeth, obviously, uh, we believe is, is fully fit again, ready to take the number four jersey. Uh, he has a happy knack of being fit for the Springboks, um, and not always, uh, you know, his injury mishaps tend to come during franchise or club duty. Uh, so he has an amazing knack of being fit for big Springbok uh, occasions. And thank goodness for that, because he's, he's a key element. Um, uh, but so his partner, uh, I suspect, again, though, it'll be reasonably logical if there's no availability of a Lut de Yacha uh, or an Ergius Neyman, who is adaptable between the four or five role. I think Franco Mostert uh, shapes up the guy who came on as a replacement earlier in the, the World Cup final anyway. Uh, the old former workhorse of the Lions um, will, be, will be ready to, to take up the cudgels again. Um, so he, he could feasibly slot into the second row as Etzebeth's partner and, and very, very little um, else in the way of change, apart from if necessitated in the next few weeks by, by mishap. Mm. Uh, Piwe also asks a prediction for, for Man of the Series. Uh, can you saw, uh, I suppose it depends who wins. Um, <laughs> if the Springboks win, um, you, you would think there'll be some, some, some very hard work done in that, in that forward pack where the likes of, you know, your, your, your heavy answers like Peter Steff and, and Dwayne will, will step up. But who are your big Bok players for this series, your potential MVPs come the end of it? Look, it would love to come from the forwards. I mean, um, I mean, Rob, in one of his columns, highlighted the fact that whenever the Lions come South Africa, they pick a lock as a captain. It, 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 is a for, it, it is a physical statement of intent that you're going to pick one of our strongest guys um, to, to push us forward. I mean, Paul O'Connell, um, when he was here in 2009, he wasn't the national team captain. Brown or Driscoll was. But because of Martin Johnson's success in 1997, and also throw it back at the time, he was the national team captain. But um, because of the kind of physical presence that he had at the time, um, it was clear that we need someone who's going to be the face of, or the face of physicality. So it will have to come from the forwards. It's just a case of, just to kick back at what Rob said, um, one, the volume of rugby that Stephen Kitsov has played. Mm. Um, we also need to look at the kind of depth um, that South Africa has um, in the event of injuries because um, you, you, you do tend to worry about, especially at, 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 this thing, at tight end, um, as much as we've had, we, we have two world-class tight ends um, in, 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 in Dando Nyagane and um, Franz Malherba. Um, you worry about, let's say, is a Thomas Dutoy good enough to step in um, in the face of, let's say, a Kian Healy? Because if there's one fear I do kind of have, it, it, it's those Irish props. Um, a lot did not go right for Ireland in that World Cup. But if there's one thing that remained firm about them was the ability of these props and their scrambling. That is one department that did not fail. Um, from a lock perspective, um, who partners it's a bit is, is uh, a, a critical factor. Um, but I do feel that it, 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 it will come from the force because it is going to take an immense forward effort um, to beat the last because it doesn't help um, having the best backline if it's always if, if it's retreating into if they're playing at the Cape Town Stadium they're forever retreating into Moor Point if they're playing at FNB Stadium they're retreating into Naturena if they're playing at Ellis Park they're retreating into Ellis Park Station so Again, the forwards, it, it, it could be a collective effort. I think it may be an even bigger collective effort that will be required um, from the Springboks because if you look back at the 2009 series, I mean, it was clear that Heinrich Brusso was the swing man. You look back at the particular game that he played for the Cheetahs um, where they lost 26-24 to the British and Irish Lions. 
where, the, where they actually realized that um, we did not prepare for this particular individual. And those tour games become very important because as I ran through the particular tour games, the British the, from, the, from the 2005 series onwards, in 2005, they beat every touring team in New Zealand, but they lost all three tests. But in every tour game, the unheralded teams have actually asked very, a number of big questions. I mean, the Kings asked serious questions of the, of the, of, 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 uh, they asked serious questions of the Lions. I mean, the Brumbies in particular, under Jake White in 2013, they sprung a massive surprise um, on the Lions, even though they went on to win the series. I mean, two of the weaker New Zealand teams in 2017, that being the Highlanders and, uh, and the Blues, they were the ones that actually beat the Lions. So I think now when, they, when the Lions in particular look at the touring, and I think even the buck management in particular, yes, there will be grouping players um, in the bubble, but I think the tour games now will take on an even bigger importance because who you're going to, you, you now have to ask the one question, do we play the buck players in the tour games? Do we risk them getting injured? But also with the fact that they haven't, uh, the, the domestic, the, the South African base players in particular, haven't played any transcontinental rugby. Are they in need of that sharpening of their tools so that they can actually be primed for the particular for, for the for the Lions challenge? Uh, Katie, I just want to add on your point there. I think we might see like uh, behind the scenes, uh, Springboks, SAA, uh, proper hit out um, to sort of buffer that lack of physicality and, and, and confrontation. Because like you say, the, 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 the tour games, they, they actually give you that real feel in terms of physicality. And I think this is where the, everybody's worried about the Springboks is that it's all good and well dancing around and training with the ball. But can you take that physicality and contact? And, and I think in the past, with having Super Rugby uh, become the, the, the preface of every international season, is that you could guarantee that the players that made it out fit and across the line from Super Rugby and entered international rugby, they were conditioned for, 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 for the physicality and the brutality that they were going to face either at a World Cup or, or at a Lions tour. Now we are entering new territory in multiple different uh, facets. And it's going to be fascinating. Mm -hmm. There's one here from, um, from, from a, a, an RJ Dialindi. Um, I'm not sure if that's a relation. Um, <laughs> about the, the fly half situation. Um, look, you would expect um, Andre Pollard to wear the 10 jersey on July 24, but he has come out of a, a kind of long-term injury situation where high intensity minutes have been limited. Um, it is a point of concern. We've got Brendan Fento, who obviously writes a column um, for our subscribers once a week. And he pointed, uh, I think, I think, I think the week before last, to number 10 being uh, the area of, of, of most concern for him heading into the series based on the fact that Pollard is so short on high intensity minutes. Um, in terms of backup, I mean, for all of the build up to, to 2019, it was a case of Pollard first choice, Elton second choice, um, you know, Elton's still not able to make it onto the onto the, the, the first team bench because of the fact that it was the 6-2 split. But, you know, if Pollard went down, um, Elton um, would have played 10 in, in a semi-final or, or a Rugby World Cup final. Can we still say that now, given the given the form of a Mornay stain um, uh, at the Bulls under, under Jake White at the moment? Um, is Elton still next in line for that 10 jersey? I mean, we, we don't want to ever... Um, you know, uh, look ahead with too much doom and gloom. But if for whatever reason, Andre Pollard was not able to start on July 24, who wears the, the 10 jersey for the Springboks? And I, I want to hear from each each of you here um, briefly. Um, let's start with you, Rob. Who, 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 who plays 10 for you if Andre Pollard can't in the first test? Ooh, uh, tough one, you know, could, could depend on the conditions. Um, I think if you're looking at a wet weather game, let's not, let's not forget that we, we've got a test in, in Cape Town in sort of deep midwinter. You might just have one of those uh, lashing South Atlantic uh, beasts of a cold front come in and it's, it's very wet and cold um, and slow going, um, in which case you'll be looking at someone who's perhaps got a, um, you know, less, less concerned. You know, we know that Elton is very big on his sort of skills game. He, he's, he's a real sort of skills and touches fly half. Um, he's a sort of footballing connoisseur, if you like. Um, I suspect if, if the weather was looking looking grim, uh, you may want to overlook Elton and go more for a, a Mornay Stain type of uh, dictatorial dominator, 
will kick his goals, slightly longer range on his place kicks. Um, that could be a factor. Um, you know, uh, so it, it, I'm hedging my bets a little, but I'm saying it could depend on, on conditions. High felt, um, I'd be very confident in, in Elton's ability. He loves playing on the high felt. He loves playing on rock hard pitches, on dry winter bone hard pitches where his running game uh, becomes a big factor. And two of the tests will be on the high felt. So I think he's got a big role to play in the series. But I do just think the one concern I do have about Pollard is that he is a slow rehabber. He, he has a little bit of a, a history of when he came back from his last serious um, ACL, um, it took him a very long time to get back his, his A game. Um, yeah. And uh, by all accounts, he's, he's looked okay so far, but you know, Lions is a, is a different level of intensity um, and that's not too far away now. So the more game time he gets in the interim, the better for us to be reassured about his presence because he's vital. The way he attacks the line, attacks his channel, defends yeah. his channel very well. Um, and his, his experience just in, in the Rassi Erasmus setup, it's vital that he is fully fit. Um, so first and foremost, we do want uh, Pollard fit and firing. And I'm sure you will be. Spoo, uh, 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 agreement from your side? Yeah, no, I, I agree with Rob fully on the Alton summation. Uh, he didn't play well the last time against England in the test series um, that the box won 2 1. He actually had a terrible time. Even the South African yeah. fans were on top of him. Not his favorite place is Mutants. Um, so in Cape Town Stadium or any. Any of those uh, uh, fields, he, he's, he's probably going to struggle, especially if it's wet and windy. I, I don't know if 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 you can maybe throw in a guy like Franz Stein into the equation as well. Maybe not as a as a ten. Uh, if you do go Alton or you're forced into an Alton, maybe you might want to go Franz Stein as a deputy ten, either at fifteen or at twelve. You know, it's I found it is very advantageous to have two ball handlers in the same game who are uh, contrast of each other, you know, because if you need to clear it, no fuss, you can you can always give it to Stain to to give it the big hoof. And if you need to be, you know, needed to go through the hands or you need to pick a pass, you find none better than Alton Yanchi. So I, I wonder if if maybe if Pollard isn't the guy, um, maybe to settle on Alton um, and then have a think about who you play Alton with. Uh, depending on 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 the conditions and and you, you like I said, Franz Stainy at the back or, or even Cohen Bosch um, as as fifteen because uh, he can join the line at speed. He, he's got as big a boot as 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 Franz Stain. And I think I think the last couple of years Cohen has really risen up to to the occasion and the game plan the Sharks are playing really leans on into what the Springboks will hope to play against the the Lions. Chuck, so I want to go to you um, and just change it slightly and, and focus it more towards a France stain. Um, you know, the role uh, that he played at Rugby World Cup 2019 was obviously immense. He was uh, the sole reason that the Springboks were able to go into big matches with that 6-2 uh, split on the bench. Um, you know, covers uh, a range of positions uh, or, or off the bench. You know, can cover the 10, can cover 12, can cover 15. Uh, probably not the quickest in the world anymore, but can probably do a job out wide as well. Um, is it concerning that we were talking about Rainbow Cup now um, and that the Cheetahs haven't been playing uh, in the tournament? Um, and that obviously means in a, in a, in a, in a, in a front stain situation that he hasn't been playing. Um, is, that, is that a concern for you uh, at all? Or is he just that type of player who has so much experience and mileage uh, under the belt now um, that he just, he's been there before, he's done it before. He can he can step into a into a bot camp ahead of a Lions tour and just switch it on and be okay. Um, do you still think he's going to play a big role uh, in the series? Look, he should. Um, I think the concern to 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 answer the cheaters part, it is a misstep from SA Rugby to exclude them from this particular competition, especially when it became clear that the European teams were not going to come to South Africa, nor allow um, the South African teams to actually travel to their destinations. So I think that is the first mistake. They should have just remodeled the competition to suit their particular needs and play all five teams because that also would have given a number of outlier players at the Cheetahs um, a prospect of actually um, pushing a selection case because it looks like now the Cheetahs is just being used as a stepping stone to go to either to, to the bigger franchises or go overseas. So it is it, it, that has now kind of uh, taken away what um, an opportunity for France State to be up to speed. 
Um, at 15, I don't think he's an option because I don't think he, he has the pace anymore. Um, at 10, I, I sometimes worry about um, his distribution game. Um, he certainly has a tactical kicking. That cannot be disputed. Um, but whether he has a distribution game to stay at 10, uh, it, it, it did not come into question for the for, for the world. It, it wasn't required for the World Cup. But even when he, he was trialed as a 10, um, I think it was 2008, he played a bit like the France turn of great college where he just relied on just getting through the line and offloading. Um, but at senior level, um, sizes, sizes tend to equal out. So, he, but he does become an important factor. Um, look, it, it, it's it, it, how, I mean, Pollard, the Pollard question is actually the trickiest part in that he, while he's been warming up all of Montpellier in France, you also need to understand that the quality of the teams vary in France. Whereas if you play in the UK, um, if you played in Wales, played in Ireland or in England in particular, you would have got a feel for who is he going to play against. Uh, and the fact that he missed the bulk um, of the European tournament meant that he actually missed the games against your Masters, your the, 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 the England sides, your the, the, the Celtic nations. And that would have given us a very good idea of how ready was. Rob makes a very good point about um, makes a very good point about uh, Pollard being a very slow rehabber because I was at the Albany test um, when he was run over by Anthony Leonard Brown where he was fit to play a test match but you could see that he was well short of a gallop. Um, with an Elton versus Monet, um, the Newlands, I mean, the, the, I remember the particular, the, the particular England is against Newlands. Um, I think the one thing we also need to say that the Bockforts took an absolute beating but also the fact that they actually took the foot of the pedal because the series had been won by then. I suspect it could have been a bit of a different response if the series at the time was on the line. But again, it was a very intuitive test that um, the box lost. Those, it, 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 it was a good thing that the box lost those two games against England because it gave them an idea of what they needed to do in the event that they are, they are faced with these conditions. Because, I mean, anything could have happened with the weather in Yokohama on, on that particular November night, but the box were prepared. It's just that, as you've been rightly alluding to, a 20-month gap has left such a vacuum with regards to how the box are going to play, who and how are they going to employ the personnel? Because um, now, what the British, what the British and Irish Lions players have to their advantage is game time, and that unfortunately cannot be replicated in training, and it cannot, be, it cannot be replicated across a series of domestic games. So, look, I think. I won't say that the box or oh, that the box are on a wing and a prayer, but look, it's, 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 it's going to be a hard ask for them. But look, again, the box, we need to remember that they're a team that thrive on being a back to the wall side and they thrive on momentum. If they win that first test, I anything can and will be possible. Mm. Question here from Nico Stein uh, asking about the availability of players like Peter Steff, Detroit, Malcolm Marks, Vili LaRue, as far as I know. Uh, all three of those players will will be will be fit and and, and available for for selection. Uh, and then one from anonymous uh, uh, questioning the the form of of of, of Captain Sio um at the 1995 um, after the World Cup win. Um, the immediate question arose whether Francois Pino was the best in his position. We have a similar form problem now with Kulisi. Um This is from anonymous. Um, that's uh, quite a bold call, I think. I don't know if we could say that. I mean, in my opinion, um, uh, you know, as I said, I think uh, Sia is probably looking in, in better better shape and form than he was heading into the 2019 Rugby World Cup, given the minutes that he's had under his belt um, at the Sharks. But let's talk a bit about that position, because it is interesting in the sense that, I mean, we would expect Sia to, to start and captain all three matches against the British and Irish Lions. But where it becomes interesting is the cover off the bench that came in the form of a Francois Lowe, uh, who is now retired. Um, where do we see that cover coming from now, that specialist kind of um, loose forward cover? I mean, geez, you're going to have Sia at six, Peter Steff to Toy at seven, Dwayne Vermeulen at eight, uh, any day of the week when, when those three players are available. Um, but you need someone who's versatile, who's strong, uh, who's skilled on the ground, to, to come off the bench and do a job as France were loaded at Rugby World Cup 2019. It looked like a player like Sikumbuzo Noche was in the running for, 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 for a role like that until he was injured and very unfortunately ruled out of the series. Um, then it looked like it was going to be a Marco van Staden uh, Eskom who was, who, was shooting, who was putting lights out at the Bulls uh, under Jake. And now there's just the very cheeky and timely return of a Marcel Kutsia, who, who, will, who will start for the Bulls 
um, uh, this weekend. Uh, is, it, is it down to those two players, uh, Akutsia versus Van Staden, for that loose forward uh, role, Rob? Um, yes, I would say, uh, straight answer, those, those two uh, would be the next in line for a number six position. Uh, Marcel Kutsia is a little bit like Sia in terms of being quite a sort of hybrid uh, loose forward, uh, able to play. Um, in, in fact, he's able to play very comfortably in all three positions. I see Sia as a, a comfortable six and a comfortable seven. Uh, Marcel Kutsia has shown that he can play in all three positions. So he'll be like gold in a, in a, um, in a bio bubble where versatility is fantastic because you never know what sort of dramas might happen in terms of injuries and so on. So his return, uh, which will, I mean, I greatly look forward to seeing what he looks like when he turns out for the Bulls um, against the Stormers. Um, but uh, he's a class act, um, whether you have him at six, seven or eight, frankly, uh, capable of all those roles. Uh, Marco van Staden also have been playing some superb rugby. Uh, one of the, the sort of brighter lights, if you like, uh, I mean, Chox was saying uh, how Super Rugby Unlocked was a, a bit of drudgery, which was very true. The one guy who made it not look like drudgery was perhaps uh, Marco van Staden, who, who played like, uh, you know, um, he, he really shot the lights out, uh, as we, we know, hence the nickname, um, and, and looked really good. But apparently he, it sounded like he was a little bit fringe uh, until very recently, that he was a late addition um, to the Springbok mix, which is interesting. So there were obviously some reservations uh, in the minds of of, um, of Rossi and Jacques. Uh, who knows the, the full, you know, dynamics. But um, but in answer to your question, I think if you're looking at uh, any vacancy uh, for that number six role, um, especially in the Francois Lowe backup position to see a, of, of, you know, from the bomb squad, uh, I think you'll be targeting one of uh, a Van Staden or a Kutsia. With, and for my money, a Kutsia, because of his range of versatility, might be the guy who, who steps in, uh, in in that context. Mm. Ms. Prue, from your side, just on Sia, I mean, any concerns at all over game time or, or fitness or form? Um, it looks to be heading in the right direction for me uh, at the right time heading into, into the Lions series. I mean, geez, he's, gonna, he's a guy now, you know, that that superstar status means that every movement, every ruck, every time he hits a ruck and gets the ball in his hands, uh, all eyes are on him. His game is scrutinized um, probably more than anyone else's. Um, but just your thoughts on what you've seen so far from him um, during Rainbow Cup. Is he on the right track? I have to say that this is uh, the closest I've seen to peak Sia since um, France toured here for a three-match tour. Um, where he was just absolutely unplayable. Uh, I've never seen a better Sia Colisi um, since that France uh, a series. Uh, I think that was 20, 2018, if I'm not mistaken, or 2017, actually. 2017, sorry. And in that time, obviously, he struggled with injuries. And he's another one. Diesel engine takes a while to start after, after um, injury. And at the World Cup, you know, we'll all be fair and say that that wasn't peak Sia. And, you, you know, you'll take Sia at 70, 80 percent because of everything else that he brings. But what I saw, especially in the game against Stormers, I think they were at home at Kings Park. Like Sia taking the line really, really hard, not afraid of content, not shy of content, breaking through tackles, freeing up runners and, and, and showing his considerable speed for, for, for a back row forward. I, I like that. It was a glimpse. But I was like, oh, it's still there. You know, um, I, I, I wanted to see that. Uh, I like seeing that because that's the Sia Kodisi we know and love. That means if, he, if he's taking the ball up to opponents, that means he's going to put himself in the line of fire when it comes the other way. And we know how destructive uh, a tackler he can be, uh, putting himself in racks in those dangerous situations. And as far as who can replace him, I think... Francois Lowe wasn't a, a, an exact like-for-like -like replacement. Uh, he, he, was a, he was a change up in tempo and in intensity and, and in strategy when he came on for Sia Kulisi in the second half. The closest for me to a Francois Lowe would be Marco van Staden. I see Marcel, Marcel Kutsia, but his brittle nature for me, I worry because this series is going to be absolutely, absolutely brutal. Um, I worry that you know, a cap or precious time might be spent on Marcel and, and, and he might go down again. And I'm not being unfair here. He has a history of injury. He missed out on the World Cup uh, be because he suffered a, a late, late injury. He was a shoe in to go. Um, I wonder if they shouldn't just go straight to Marco van Staden. Um, but if you're looking for someone who can do Sia's role, aside from Sia Colisi, 
Then Reynard Alstad will be your guy. Also played very, very well at Toulouse. Uh, is a line-out option, can play back row and second row. Here's some ball carrier, defender, all, all of that, uh, Hutters. Um, so it, it, it's it's a balancing act. He's another one that missed out on the last camp in Bloomington just before they announced the, yeah. the, the Spring World Cup squad. So... Uh, yeah, yeah, it's 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 a it's a very dicey balancing act. I think to be safe, have him in the bubble, have him in the SA18, and then when the need arises and you feel like you're you're going backwards in in the physical contest, chuck a, a Reynard Elstad in because you're not going to win this game on flash and 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 all sorts of other stuff. You're you're, you're going to win this game on on confrontation. Mm. Uh, I can tell you that for free. Uh, so, so you need to have someone like Alstad. He just played now in the in the European uh, Championship final with um, Cheslin Colby. So he's brimming with confidence. Mm. I'm going to go to another and, and our last uh, reader reader question from Sahani, who wants to know what the reasoning behind playing Georgia before the Lions was, rather than a stronger opponent. I don't think it was uh, much of a choice, uh, to be honest. If you look at the that little window. Uh, of international rugby that's happening at, at that same time. Much of it is the, the kind of top tier nations playing against uh, second tier nations. You know, you've got Canada and your, uh, your Samoa is playing. Um, I think, I think it Canada are playing in Europe against, is, is it Ireland Canada or Wales Canada or something like that? And uh, then you've got kind of Fiji uh, playing against the All Blacks uh, and Australia. Uh, I think all around the world, that kind of two, three week window is split up between pretty much. Um, top tier and second tier nations i think the exception is australia france which happens uh, over the same time i think for south africa it was just a case of getting test match rugby under the belt look not the strongest opposition you're going to face uh, surely not the ideal preparation you want ahead of alliance series um but test rugby nonetheless um and you know on the level of a canada or a or a Samoa or a Tonga, a George is kind of on that second tier level and they, they will certainly ask some questions of of the springboks along the way I wonder that I wonder that Lloyd, if we, we if we didn't miss a slide trick, maybe bring in a Samoa uh, as well and see if we can entice them because we know in the times of we face them, we've been lucky to get out alive. Yeah, yeah. you know. Um, I think the closest you'll get to the kind of game that you'll get at the Lions is actually a game against Samoa. Yeah, I'd lose a few players to injury, Sabu. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I have, and, and also I think the issue with Samoa is are you going to get the best side from a Samoan perspective because the bulk of their best players are based in Europe and um, a lot of those clubs um, where those particular players are based um, are the biggest adherents of the Regulation 9 when it comes to the um, releasing of players so that's the first challenge um, that you'd face with regarding mm -hmm. to actually play um, the, the Pacific Islanders and again, I mean, look, it, the, the, the ragtag rugby that the Pacific Islanders play, um, I think wouldn't have suited the box in, for, from, from a preparation perspective. But the hardening up uh, part is, is actually the most important part. Because I remember Zane Kapil in particular, um, when England played Tonga in the World Cup. I mean, he, he, I think he's one of the reasons why I believe Vunipola isn't on this tour. Because if a Zane Kapil can level, um, as good as Zane Kapil is, if a Zane Kapil can level a Billy Vunipola, um, what what can kind of, well, it, it's clear that then he, he, he cannot pass master against the Dwayne Vermeulen. Um, so it would have been interesting to see how a Dwayne Vermeulen versus a CJ Standard would have happened, but clearly that battle is not going to happen because CJ has now retired and won't be part of this tour. Um, so that, that that Georgia game, as much as they may not have the backs to challenge um, to challenge uh, the the Springboks. If a, if a country can produce a player like Amamuka um, Kogodza, I mean, even if you watch them at under 21 level, they haven't got the flashiest of backs, but their forwards ask very pertinent questions of the opposition. I mean, just to go back to, just to go back to the, uh, the I, I like the, 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 the Rock Elstad part that you built, um, you, you actually raised. Yes, um, Elstad may not be the most mobile of the forwards, but if there's one thing that we saw through the World Cup is that the European teams, do not like uh, this thing, a, a fire on fire battle. Whenever, I mean, even Japan, when they played Ireland, Japan actually were in Ireland's faces. And it was clear that Ireland were discomforted when the All Blacks played Japan or uh, played the Ireland quarterfinals in their faces. So, I mean, it, if there's one team that was able to put up a proper physical battle, um, it was the Welsh. I mean, England, they played against a New Zealand side that for some, for some inexplicable reason, 
uh, departed from what would have been a basic game for them. But when they met, uh, when they when they met an equal force, um, when it came to the Springboks, they were literally out. They were literally literally out answers. But I think with Marcel Coutier, you're right because I think the term we need to use with Marcel Coutier is that he tends to write physical checks that his body cannot catch. <laughs> Listen, uh, chaps, we've got three minutes left uh, here. I want to thank you all for, for taking the time. I want to thank uh, our subscribers who, who've registered and, and fired in some questions and who have, um, hopefully we've got through most of them and, and provided some answers. Uh, this is the first of what will be many uh, uh, editors' tables and, and online webinar discussions around uh, all the rugby that's to come throughout the, the rest of the year with rugby championship to follow and, 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 and obviously the main event that is the Lions Tour. Um, and thank you to everyone who was who was streaming on YouTube as well. Um, we appreciate that. We, uh, quickly, I'm going to give the three of you the option. We, we, we have to leave it with a prediction. I will allow you to sit on the fence um, if that is where you would like to stay, because I myself am uh, uh, very aware of the fact that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not very good at predictions. Um, so whatever I, whatever I said would probably be be wrong, and it is going to be that tight. Uh, you, you know the 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 Lions are, are the bookies' favourites. We can say that much according to the bookies. Um, the Springboks uh, start the series as underdogs, um, and I guess it depends which uh, you know which camp you're in. Um, look, two one box is 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 my safe uh, kind of prediction for the series. Uh, but Rob, uh, a nice and brief from you. What do you think? Sorry, I'm, I'm going to be boring. I'm going to go your route, 2-1, two, 2-1 one. Two, one to Springboks. Uh, you, ne you never get clean sweeps when the when the Lions come to South Africa. Um, uh, I, I still think that it's somewhere along the line. We mustn't get too arrogant. We mustn't think, you know, 3-0, we're going to, you know, wipe the floor with these guys. Lions series never quite turn out that way. Um, I think a safe bet would be 2-1 would be to, to South Africa. And with the Lions, perhaps, if South Africa have gone 2-0 up, uh, interesting to see what the Springboks might do with their team for the third test. Will they do a Peter de Villiers, knowing that he's got further business down the line in terms of a, a rugby championship or a then Tri Nations? Uh, sure. Do you sort of freshen up your team for the third test and, and feel the, a slightly more rookie side, which will be vulnerable, as we discovered uh, when the Lions were here in 2009? So I think that the safest bet, uh, without wanting to be too sort of confident, would be 2 1 South Africa. Spook. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'm going to qualify this prediction with, with uh, the fact that I don't think um, uh, Warren Gatlin really, really picked the best squad. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lean to a 2-1 as well. But I think it's going to be 1-0 uh, to the Lions first up. Um, and then I think the Springboks will, will rally. Uh, and come back. I, 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 something tells me that uh, Warren Gatlin might have missed a trick or two with with the squad selection. I could be wrong. Um, <laughs> I could be wrong, but it it, it just seemed a, a little too left field for me. Uh, yeah, especially in the in the back line. Um, but yeah, let me let me let me go boring as well. Two one, I two one. Predictions but all. I come back. I come back to one at least. I come back to one. That that's. That's my prediction. <laughs> right, fair enough, fair enough. Mr. Traku, from your side? I'll give it a, a, I'll give it a one all draw with the first test in Cape Town being drawn and then the results speak up country. <laughs> based, no, and I'll tell you why. It's based on Rob's uh, prediction of the weather. Because if that Northwester blows and brings in a cold front, um, points will become a premium. And if there's one ground that will either guarantee a close result or a draw, it's Cape Town Stadium. And the high fell because of the way they hear it is also guaranteed. That's that's a hell of a prediction. If you pull that off, can you so sport 24 will buy you a crystal ball to, to put up next to you for the, for the next one of these that we do? That'll be it. If, if you get it down to the direction of the wind, uh, that, that will be superb. But thank you very much to everyone again from my side. That was fun. I really enjoyed it. Um, and yeah, we'll we'll uh, just be sure to follow us. We'll be Sport Twenty Four will be bringing you all developments, all of the build up to the Lions series, uh, all of the live action um, and reaction uh, from those matches and the tour matches. And we're looking very forward to it. It's been far too long, but Test Match Rugby is back now, well and truly. Um, and we just can't wait to get going. So please stay tuned to Sport Twenty Four. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Goodbye. <laughs>